Good afternoon and welcome to today's energy seminar. Uh, today we have uh, with us our very own Chris Field, who's the Perry M M McCarty Director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and the Melvin and J Joan Lane Professor of Interdisciplinary Environmental Studies. Here at Stanford, prior to that, he was a staff member at the Car Carnegie Institution for Science and founding director of the Carne Carnegie's Department of Global Ecology from 2002 to 2016. And on a more personal note, I think we all owe Chris a great uh, 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 gratitude for his uh, willingness to take on many uh, leading science uh, positions and uh, administrative positions for the science community. In particular, uh, he's been a great colleague uh, in the Stanford Energy Environment community for many years an outstanding uh, member of the international uh, scientific community. And last but not least, in my case, a stand-up, a uh, very influential person in the affairs of the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And today he's gonna talk on a subject, he'll probably tell you I don't know anything about that subject, but I think I do. And I've uh, probably learned as much uh, or more from him than anybody else. And his topic today is, Biomass Energy and Natural Climate Solutions, a meaningful piece of the solutions portfolio, a very uh, important and timely topic. Chris, take it away. Well, thank you so much, John, for the introduction and the chance to share some thoughts with all of you. I wanna be clear up front that my bottom line is, is in the title. You know, we live in a kind of an all-in society and it's, it's always a challenge to present a, a nuanced picture that says, this is a topic that has some really compelling advantages, but it also has some compelling disadvantages. And that's gonna be the message that I'll be leaving all of you with today. Uh, let me start out with just a comment on, on uh, the role of biomass in our current energy system. You know, we tend to think about um, the, idea that we live in a, in a fossil economy, but it's important to remember that all that fossil fuel used to be biomass at some point, and it actually was really a lot of biomass. <laughs> Jeff Dukes did a really wonderful study of this uh, almost 20 years ago now, where he calculated the efficiency with which organic matter was converted into fossil fuels, and his conclusion was that producing a single gallon of gasoline required about 90 tons of ancient plant matter. And if you scale that up to the scale of today's current energy system, what you come up with is that the fossil fuels that we burned a couple decades ago uh, contained uh, the equivalent of 44 exagrams of carbon, more than 400 times the current annual primary production of the planet's current biota. So we're drawing on buried sunshine we run a, a biomass economy now, not a fossil fuel economy, but it's one that, that requires many, many years of primary production in order to get a single year of fossil fuel reserves. Uh, you know, there are a lot of compelling reasons to think about biomass playing a bigger role in the, in the energy mix. And, um, and I'll, I'll be dealing with each of these in, in sequence. Um, the first one is that Biomass accounts for really big fluxes in the carbon cycle, big relative to fossil fluxes. Also it plays a major role in, in emissions of greenhouse gases other than CO2. Biomass provides some uniquely compelling options for producing liquid fuels uh, compared to a lot of the technology options that are on the horizon. Most of the things involving biomass are relatively ready to go now. Biomass provides some of the few options for generating negative emissions, for removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And when we start talking about negative emissions, we also begin to relax the constraints on timing of the solution. Maybe we can emit now and draw down later, which provides some profound economic advantages. And then finally, solutions involving biomass can have profound co-benefits, co-benefits in terms of the conservation agenda or in terms of, of building strong economies. But there are a lot of reasons to be worried about biomass as well. 
And probably the most important, the overwhelming one is that, that growing biomass requires massive amounts of land. There are always speculations about, well, couldn't we use marginal land or desert? And the answer in general is no, that producing large amounts of biomass requires large amounts of good land, with abundant water and fertilizer. Sometimes biomass energy has questionable mitigation benefits. That's been especially the case with, with <clears throat> ethanol from corn, where the natural gas inputs for grinding and drying and processing the corn often amount to about as much energy as the, as the ethanol output uh, you get. Uh, it's also really challenging to account for the indirect consequences of whatever we do when we when we allocate an acre to corn production for biomass does that mean that now the demand for corn has gone up and another acre gets deforested and are we accounting for that properly it's also important to remember that this possibility of separating emissions and removals in time can be regarded as a license for delay in some ways it's a, a strategy not only for giving us a little more time flexibility, but for kicking the can down the road in terms of, of solutions. And we wanna make sure that we're not thinking about embracing biomass as a way to avoid responsibility. And finally, it's important to recognize that a lot of the solutions that result in an increase in biomass and a decrease in carbon in the atmosphere uh, may not be permanent. It may be that we're solving a problem in one place only to have it come back later, or that we're solving it in one place uh, only to have it come out in another part of the Earth system. So big issues that need to be dealt with. Before we talk specifics, I, I wanna just go through a couple of numbers that are good to keep in mind. The first is that most of the material that I'm gonna talk about today is gonna to be in gigatons of CO2. A gigaton and a petagram are the same thing, a billion tons or 10 to the 15th grams. I'm gonna present material that's mostly in units of carbon dioxide. Conversion between carbon and carbon dioxide is simply the ratio of the molecular weights, but you see the numbers both way. And from a, from a biosphere perspective, the units that make the most sense are the carbon ones, but the units that we talk about in the context of solving the climate problem are usually the CO2 ones. In converting from biomass to carbon is relatively straightforward. Most biomass is about 50% carbon. And the energy content of dry biomass is kind of in the middle of the range for decent coal. It's about half of the energy content of oil or natural gas. A second uh, set of numbers I'd like everybody to keep in mind as we, as we go through the details is, is the amount of area that's required. So the, um, the, the total ice-free land area of the Earth is, um, is a little under 15 billion hectares. A hectare is about two and a half acres. About 10% of that is cropland now. About 20% of it is grazing land. And when we start talking about deploying new kinds of solutions at the scale of uh, a billion hectares. We're talking about deploying at the scale of current global agriculture. An important constraint that I wanna make sure everybody has in mind when we talk about biomass is that the efficiency with which sunlight is converted into biomass energy usually is less than half a percent. And so when we're comparing biomass Based technologies with, with industrial technologies, we need to deal with this really low efficiency. And we also need to deal with the really large amounts of water that are required to grow plants. And a, a typical number is that it takes about 500 units of water to produce one unit of plant. Before we, we talk details, I want to just make sure everybody's up to speed on a couple of important features of the global carbon cycle. We all think a lot about the emissions of CO2 from the uh, combustion of fossil fuels and from deforestation, but it's important to recognize that photosynthesis on land is a very large flux uh, relative to either of these. Um, it's, it's approximately five times the size of the fossil flux is the global uh, annual plant growth on land. But that's not a net 
uptake because on an annual basis, there's also a comparably sized release from land in respiration and fire. So the, the average annual land balance in recent years has been uh, the sum of these, um, these emissions and the uptake. Just to, to complete the picture on the oceans, we have a, a similar large amount of CO2 dissolves in the oceans on an annual basis and a, a comparably large amount is released, but they're not exactly the same. And so there's a net sink in the oceans and in recent years has been around 9 billion tons of, of CO2 per year. It's important to recognize that these two net fluxes, the sink in the oceans and, and this sink of natural land are, are really big free subsidies that we receive from nature for free now. And when we look at solving the climate challenge, uh, preserving those two fluxes to the largest extent possible is, is one of the key opportunities we have and one of the key responsibilities. And when we add up all these fluxes in the global carbon cycle, the overall net is the sum of the emissions from fossil fuel and land use change, uh, plus the the sinks on land and in oceans, so that the atmosphere currently on an annual basis is um, gaining about half of the total emission from uh, fossil fuels and land use. And so the airborne fraction is about 50%. The, the final piece of setup that I wanna provide is, a, is um, zeroing in on, on where the emissions are coming from. As, as you know, about three quarters of recent emissions come from the energy sector and, and the remaining quarter comes from agriculture, forestry and other land use, what's awkwardly called a FOLU here, and industry and waste with industry being particularly steel and cement manufacturing. If we dive in in a little more detail, this ag and forestry sector includes several really important fluxes from livestock rearing, agricultural soils, methane emissions from rice, deforestation, and, um, and cropland soils. And when we think about deploying biomass solutions, a lot of the solutions are going to be in the spirit of decreasing these emissions from agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Now, when we, when we think about constructing solutions to the global climate problem, it's important that we think in budget mode. We know there's essentially a linear relationship between the total amount of carbon dioxide since we started emitting carbon dioxide and, and the total amount of warming. And that warming is essentially forever. So that we know the um, emissions through 2019 have been a little over 2,300 billion tons of CO2. If we wanna have a 66% probability of limiting warming to 1.5 C or less, we've got about a little less than 2,800 billion tons of total capacity. If we move that to 2 C, it goes to about 3,540 billion tons. So the overall uh, math is that if we want to have a 66% probability of limiting, limiting warming to 1.5 C, the remaining budget is order of 500 billion tons of CO2. A 66% probability of limiting to 2 C is order 1,200 billion tons of CO2. And if you simply divide the 2019 emissions into those numbers, you can see that we have very little time left without the budget being exhausted. For that uh, 1.5 number, it's less than a decade. For the 2C number, it's on the order of two to three decades. It's obviously the reason that there's so much emphasis on the timing of tackling the climate problem, but it's also an important reminder of why negative emissions in the future could be important. They provide the opportunity of exceeding the budget and then backing down to, uh, to meeting it at a later time. The, exactly what time we want to meet it is, is not determined anywhere in policy. So when we look at how we might achieve that in terms of an emissions trajectory, I'll think in terms of business as usual, and then cutting our emissions through the century. But it's important to note that there are some CO2 emissions that are really difficult to decrease. And there are some emissions of other 
greenhouse gases that are difficult to decrease. And if we want to get to zero, as is required by the budget, we need to come up with some way to generate negative emissions, either with an industrial process or a biological process, so that we can start generating negative emissions in the relatively near term and make the whole economy go net negative uh, sometime in the, in the 21st century. So that a, a trajectory for a 2C might look like this with a, a building pool of, of negative emissions starting in the near term and a trajectory that gets us to 1.5C requires an even bigger pool of, of negative emissions and a transition to making the global economy net negative closer to mid-century than at the, at the end of the century. This, um, this challenge of negative emissions has really shaped a lot of the discussion about climate change solutions. And if you, you ask how much we're talking about, the, um, the interquartile range for the recent IPCC special report on 1.5C is 600 to 1,000 gigatons of CO2 negative emissions removed from the atmosphere between now and 2100, more than the total remaining budget for 1.5 C. And there are lots of approaches we can use for this. We can use industrial approaches, geological, oceanic, biological or combined, but that we've got to think about it both for um, generating net negative emissions across the whole economy and for offsetting the difficult to reduce or intractable emissions from things like steel or cement manufacturing, methane or nitrous oxide from agriculture. Negative emissions have also come into focus because at least in principle, a lot of the options are ready to go technologically and look like they're likely to be affordable. I, I do wanna emphasize though that this issue of a temporal disconnect is really a slippery slope. And there's nothing in any international climate negotiation that says when we would get back to our target. And there also is, is nothing that um, intrinsically holds the feet to the fire of countries, companies, emitters that really uh, encourages, strongly encourages, requires a linkage between delaying emissions now and really being serious about negative emissions in the future. It's one of the big liabilities associated with the biomass solutions that generate negative emissions. So there are really three ways you can get to negative emissions. The one is using the land and ocean, amplifying the kinds of sinks that we already talked about. The second is biomass energy with carbon capture and storage, where the basic idea is um, Growing biomass removes CO2 from the atmosphere. The biomass is converted into electricity in a power plant, producing CO2, which is then grabbed and uh, compressed and injected into a geological storage, uh, producing electricity as a consequence of the, the way the operation is managed. And the other technology option is direct air capture, where the basic idea is that uh, CO2 is, is stored in a, in a chemical solution um, captured from the atmosphere, put in a chemical solution, released from the chemical solution, compressed and, and pumped into a geological reservoir with a net input of electricity. Um, land and ocean sinks are something that happen all the time and we, we know how to manage them. BEX involves relatively simple technologies that we think we know how to do and direct air capture involves a, a combination of things at a variety of different levels of technology readiness. The, the pictures of what these look like is that growing forests, uh, we really know how to do uh, direct air capture. We're beginning to see deployed at the um, something between the laboratory and the full industrial scale and biomass energy with carbon capture is, is beginning to be deployed at approximately the million ton scale, so commercial but not transformative of the, of the Earth system. And when we look at the way the carbon cycle is envisioned in the future, it, most of the thinking is around very large amounts of negative emission. This is an example from Shell's sky scenario, which is their 2C scenario. And you can see the combination of 
a very large amounts of energy from biomass and uh, substantial amounts of negative emissions here showing something over 10 billion tons per year of, of negative emissions with uh, CO2 captured um, either from the air or from uh, smokestack emissions and injected into geological reservoirs. So the idea that uh, we solve the problem on the back of large amounts of negative emissions really key to the thinking and, and key to the way we process biomass energy going forward. So uh, what, what are our biomass options? There, there are lots uh, when we think about, and there, there are two main flavors of, of biomass for climate solutions that I wanna talk about. The, the first is, is biomass as an energy source where we're harvesting biomass, using it for energy and uh, either doing that as a low CO2 or a, a no CO2 option, depending on whether we capture the CO2. The second is uh, enhancing natural sinks or decreasing releases from natural ecosystems. For biomass energy, we can look at lots of sources from, from waste, uh, from good stewardship, for example, removing excess fuels in wildfire areas or dedicated uh, biomass. And, and most of the thinking in recent years has been about dedicated biomass crops, but I think that there are many not yet developed opportunities in the good stewardship and in the waste biomass. When we look at natural climate solutions, there are two important pathways we need to think about. One is pathways that slow emissions that are already occurring that account for that 5.3 billion tons of net land use, things from deforestation, peatland degradation. And then there are lots of ways to increase the sinks that are already an important part of the carbon cycle, but become, can become even more important as a result of uh, investments in improving forest management, expanding forest areas, and improving the way we, we manage soils. I'm gonna go through a, a, a number of specific results now, many with colleagues from my own lab, and uh, I'm gonna give credit to the people who have contributed to all those studies over um, more than 20 years now. So the, um, the, the first topic I wanna to talk about is, is uh, biomass for liquid fuels, within, which in the U.S. is, is primarily liquid fuels from, from corn. It's an example of, of a way that progress toward biomass energy has really been driven by policy um, incentives that are totally separated from protecting climate. It's really important to remember that the, the reason we have a blending mandate for ethanol in gasoline is as much to do with the calendar of presidential primaries as it is to do with anything else. Uh, the renewable fuel standard is a part of both the Energy Policy Act of 2005 and the Energy Independence and Security Act of, of 2007. In, in 2017, which is last year for which I could find information, 9.2% of the gasoline sold in the U.S. was was ethanol, and it consumes about 40% of the, of the U.S. corn crop. The, um, the, the thing that's really tricky about the way we produce ethanol now is that it really has questionable emissions reductions. The, the big controller on whether or not you get any emissions reductions in the production of ethanol from corn grain is whether the grain is, is um, dried using natural gas or not. If it's dried using natural gas, you often have uh, greater CO2 emissions in the production of the ethanol than you save by, by offsetting the, the gasoline. Um, but with, with the most modern available techniques, there is a, a, a modest amount of emissions reduction. The, the real advantage of using ethanol for transportation fuel in the U.S. until now has been a way to convert a gaseous fuel, natural gas, into a liquid fuel that burns in the, in the current fleet of vehicles. There also is the potential for 
uh, dramatic improvements in the emissions reduction from ethanol with advanced techniques for producing cellulosic fuels. But those have been slow to come online, uh, partly because the incentives haven't been terribly strong and partly because of complicated biochemistry and technology. Uh, a dozen years or so ago in, in my lab, Elliot Campbell said, well, it, if we're gonna use corn for transportation, uh, should we be using it to make ethanol? And, and Elliot did a, did a study where he said, okay, let's take the 2008 technology for making ethanol and the 2008 technology for electric vehicles and just ask about transportation efficiency. How many, how many miles per acre do you get if you um, convert biomass into ethanol? versus converting biomass into electricity and charging the batteries in an electric car. And back in 2009, what Elliot concluded was that the ethanol pathway gives you about 8,000 vehicle miles per, air, per acre. And even in 2009, the uh, bioelectricity pathway gave you almost twice as much um, transportation output per acre of dedicated land. So even then with the primitive status of, um, of the available electric vehicles. It, it wasn't that we got um, a technology advantage from uh, producing ethanol. It was that the existing fleet was of uh, internal combustion vehicles. And that was where the demand was. And now that we have a compelling set of electric vehicle options, the motivation for using ethanol for at least for light vehicle transportation is getting to be less and less. It's worth asking whether or not we might wanna to continue to use liquid fuels from biomass for uh, aircraft transportation, which is the, the, um, the main transportation area where there are not electrification options. Let me talk for just a couple minutes about how much biomass we might get for bioenergy. And, and one way to do that is to ask how much land is available that we're not using for something else. So it's, it's hard to figure out how much land we've got that we're not using. We have pretty good maps of the land that we use for crop and pasture. And I already told you the areas that are involved with those. And we have a pretty good record of where cropping and pasturing uses have been over the last couple of centuries. And so that allows us to make a, a pretty decent map of where land has been abandoned. And one of the things that's striking if you look at the map of abandoned cropland is, is the eastern half of the US is one of the only areas in the world where there was a wholesale movement of cropland agriculture from one area to another when agriculture shifted basically from um, New England to the, to the Great Plains. Anyhow, with these maps of abandoned crop and agriculture we, and pasture, we can say, okay, well, how much plant material could you have grown in those areas? And then uh, what could you get in terms of biomass energy from that? And if we look globally, um, it turns out that um, the amount of total global primary production in, in croplands, about um, 6.8 billion tons of carbon per year, 11.6 in pasture land, and about 3.3 of that is in abandoned areas. But a lot of those abandoned areas have now returned to forest or in, in cities and they're not uh, available for use. So about 1.2 billion tons of carbon is potentially available from abandoned lands that we could use for biomass energy. If you convert that into the amount of energy, you get uh, 16 exajoules, about 2% of global primary energy and 4.4 billion tons of CO2 removal per year. It's a meaningful contribution, but it certainly doesn't come anywhere close to the levels that would be required in order to meet the negative emissions goals in the IPCC 1.5 degree scenarios. One interesting sort of lead on from this uh, question of, is there enough land available is to say, well, what, what would it look like if we use that for BECs, for biomass energy with carbon capture and storage? 
And Peter Turner led a study on that in, in 2018, where it took an approach that was, was similar to what we had done a decade earlier for uh, saying, well, let's focus on abandoned agriculture. But then he said, well, in what cases is the abandoned agriculture co-located with geological formations that are suitable for storing uh, CO2 underground? And in this map, you can see the, the pink showing areas of abandoned agriculture and the gray showing areas where there's a, a decent possibility of accessing suitable underground basins um, and the intensity of the green showing uh, how productive the areas are. And, and it's not too surprising that the areas that are marginal for agriculture are not the most productive. But if you, um, if you say, well, what could we do on, on um, uh, marginal land? The conclusion is that you might come up with about uh, 100 million hectares that are abandoned from agriculture and overlie a suitable geological formation. And that could result in around um, one to two billion tons of CO2 per year that could be injected into these formations. Again, it's a, a meaningful, it's a big business opportunity and a meaningful bite out of our emissions budget, uh, but it's far from solving the whole thing. It, and the U.S. is actually one of the, uh, it's kind of the Saudi Arabia for, uh, for Beck's potential. Um, Jay Beck led a really nice study that was published just a couple of years ago asking what is the overlap between areas that could produce biomass for uh, energy use and areas where we have suitable underground formations for storage. And you can see the storage sites crosshatch and the intensity of the green showing the amount of plant material available. The US has lots of good storage sites shown in the uh, brighter orange colors. And the plot on the right-hand side of the screen shows that the, the uh, fraction of that capacity that has been used up already is very light and that there's real potential for increasing carbon storage. If you combine all of that, you get a picture of um, three regions in the US, uh, kind of um, North Dakota, Montana, and Illinois and the Midwest and the, and the Gulf Coast, where there really is meaningful potential for substantial amounts of CO2 injection and available biomass that could lead in the the uh, near term to up to almost 100 million tons per year of CO2 injection. And within a few decades could lead to something in the range of about 300 to 600 million tons. Again, not solving the global problem, but getting us pretty far along. As I, as I leave the biomass energy topic, the one additional thing I wanna talk about is, is wood pellets, which are really uh, new in the conversation. But you can see that the utilization of uh, biomass for heat is substantially greater than it is for transportation or electricity. And that's mainly in, in wood pellets, which are a dominant part of the renewable energy strategy in the European New Union, mainly because they're considered carbon neutral, even though in many cases they're not. And, um, and pellets are, are attractive because they're a drop-in solution that doesn't require new technologies, but they're a frustrating solution in that um, they create a tremendous pressure for deforestation in countries that are currently operating as, as carbon sinks. And I think that uh, for an advanced wood pellet environment to move forward, it's going to need to address the fact that that they're not really totally carbon neutral, that you might get modest emissions reductions from them. And we'll spend a few minutes talking about natural climate solutions. And remember, we're talking both about slowing emissions and about increasing sinks. It's been a really hot topic in the last couple of years because uh, given generous assumptions, you can come up with some huge numbers about how much we might increase the carbon content of the uh, land biosphere. A paper by Baston and others was published in Science in 2019, argued that if you look at 
places that have um, protected areas and forest. And then you look around the world and say, well, what other places have climates like that, that there's almost a billion hectares, again, almost as much as we have in agriculture, that could have trees and that that could store 750 billion tons of CO2 over some undetermined but presumably very long time frame as, um, as the, the whatever trees were planted grew. Uh, it turns out these estimates are incredibly optimistic given very generous assumptions, but they started a, a conversation about well, what would it look like if we planted a trillion trees? Uh, how much of the problem could be solved? And, and there's been interesting, useful analysis of that. Um, some of the most interesting has come from Bronson Griscom and colleagues who argued that if we um, are really ambitious, we might be able to deploy natural climate solutions as, a, as an important slice of a, of a bigger mitigation pie. So if our mitigation is all this, we might be able to get uh, natural climate solutions up to about 10 billion tons per year over a period of, of a dozen years or so, uh, really resulting in making the climate problem transition from almost insolvable to one that we're really beginning to wrap our arms around. The analysis from, from Griscom and others identified a, a whole bunch of places where improved management could result in uh, either decreased emissions or, or increased uptake. The most of the potential is in forests and the largest potential is in, in reforestation. And Griscom and colleagues identified uh, some of that as being available at very low cost, what they can call less than $10 a ton, or at moderate cost up to $100 per ton. And you can see across the, um, the forest sector that the, the total sums to um, more than 5 billion tons, uh, if we're willing to have carbon prices up to about $100 a, a a ton. One of the things that's challenging is we don't know very much about um, how we would actually deploy a lot of these strategies at scale, but we're beginning to see them deployed at meaningful enough scales that we're learning by doing and beginning to uh, build up the stock of knowledge that's going to be important in the long-term evolution of, of this set of technologies. I think the Griscom potential is probably too optimistic and being constrained only by the finance, but it really sets an interesting, um, uh, it, it sets an interesting uh, dynamic. Other estimates have been similar. This one's from the National Academies in 2019, and it concludes that if you look across all the methods, we might get up to um, on the order of 5 billion tons of CO2 per year. Again, solving something like a quarter of the negative emissions that the, uh, that the IPCC interquartile range says will be necessary. What is the total capacity of the land and ocean sinks? You know, what is, uh, can we just keep pumping additional biomass into, into forests and grassland soils? So my, my group has been working on that and, and you can think about ecosystems is working in two contrasting ways. Uh, one is that they're, they're basically like a silo of fixed capacity and that we, we cut down a lot of vegetation in the past and, and we can regrow that if we're good stewards of the landscape. Uh, the other conceptual model is ecosystems might act like a haystack where um, as a result of things like CO2 fertilization, you can just add more and more and more biomass. If you think the silo model is correct, we're probably looking at a total storage potential in the terrestrial biosphere of something like 100 gigatons of CO2 total. The haystack might allow you to get up to about 1,000. Um, we know that over the historical period, we probably released between 750 and 1,000 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere as a result of cutting down forests and, and mistreating soils. We also know that that land sink that I talked about earlier has been operating over many years and has probably replaced about uh, 500 billion tons. 
And so you might say, well, that the remaining that could be refilled with the silo estimate should be two to 300 billion tons. And if you look at calculations that people have done about the, the remaining uh, potential in the, in the biosphere, the, the average comes out at, a, at about that, maybe a little bit more optimistic. And there've been really a lot of studies published now that say, well, how much carbon could we get into the terrestrial biosphere? And they're all summarized here in comparison to that IPCC interquartile range. And there are a few that say we could solve the entire negative emissions problem uh, with natural climate solutions, but many that are at much lower numbers. When, when we looked at all of this, we concluded that the most likely levels were um, gonna be in the range of about 200 billion tons. And that with good management of the terrestrial biosphere, and with attention to make sure that we stay at the lower range of the possible warming, that we should be able to achieve something like this level and make a contribution to anywhere from 20% um, to maybe as much as half of the negative emissions that are required in the 21st century. Let me just close with, uh, with uh, two quick comments. Uh, the, the first concerns whether natural climate solutions are, are, are unambiguously good, and then um, how much we should be investing in them. So it's important to recognize that natural climate solutions can be rich with co-benefits, but they really produce some potentially serious challenges in the space of leakage. Um, does saving carbon someplace mean that it just gets cut someplace else? Permanence, does planting a forest now just mean it's gonna burn up in a hundred years? Or additionality, um, well, when you say you are preventing this forest from being destroyed, or are you really doing something that you weren't doing otherwise? We also, I would say, just don't have the infrastructure together to provide high confidence in natural climate solutions. And when we invest in, in protecting ecosystems, we ought to be careful to make sure that we recognize that most of the threats are coming in the area of finance, governance, strong institutions, rather than in understanding the carbon cycle. How much should we be investing? You know, many of the benefits that come from having um, a vibrant natural estate aren't in terms of the carbon balance, they're in terms of protecting biodiversity, uh, protecting air and water quality, uh, having an environment that, that meets people's intellectual, emotional needs. And, and most estimates that we're probably spending something like 1% of our current climate portfolio on natural climate solutions. You know, there's no question that we ought to be spending much more than that, but we also ought to be really attentive to the fact that there are um, th there are real profound limits to how much we can get out of natural climate solutions. And even though it's tempting to rely on them for uh, abundant solutions far in the future, then we need to recognize there are profound limits and that the real pathway to effective decarbonization is gonna be aggressive investments in decarbonizing energy and industry. At the same time, we make ambitious investments in taking advantage of natural climate solutions where they can help. And I think overall, uh, you know, my philosophy is, is, is summed up in a, in a piece we published in uh, Science a, a couple of years ago. Uh, natural climate solutions are wonderful, but they're not enough to solve our problem. That's where I'd like to stop, and I look forward to your questions. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, as anticipated, uh, there's very few people who could go into as much depth as you did in all the relevant areas, and I claim no one who could weave the story together so artfully and really highlight a lot of the uh, trade-offs involved as dispassionately and scientifically as you've done, uh, which leads to a lot of questions that probably only you could answer that kind of things I uh, get asked all the time, but uh, don't feel qualified to uh, weigh in on. Um, uh, the first one, let's just move for a little quick progression, uh, and that's uh, food versus bioenergy. 
where do you stand on that uh, in general? And uh, what are the trade-offs and do's and don'ts in that space? So the idea is we, we have growing population. We might need, not sure we will need, more land to grow, more of these marginal lands to grow food in the years ahead. Uh, do we run a risk if we use too much of it up now for biofuels? Yeah, so the, 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 the most important key to understanding uh, where we are in terms of the land we need for agriculture uh, really has to do with future decisions about animal agriculture. I already mentioned that that um, we use twice as much land for grazing as we use for growing crops. Um, if you look at a, at a crop like corn in the US, we use about 40% for, for biomass energy, but we use about 40% for feeding animals as well. And if we uh, pull back on the amount of land and current crop production that we use for, for feeding animals, we, we have a abundant land that could be used either for biomass energy or for increasing food production. So that's that there's an important um, decision point that needs to be crossed. And it's hard to say what direction we're going to go with that. But that but nothing could play a bigger role in opening prospects for optionality in the future. The, a second thing that's going to be really important is whether or not we can continue to increase crop yields at the one to two percent per year that we've seen over the last several decades globally. And if we can continue to do that, then it may be that the amount of land we use for crops doesn't need to expand very much and may even be able to contract, allowing us to use some of these lands for, for um, growing food. It's important to not think of the marginal lands as a right for use for biomass or food production, because in most cases, these were abandoned from food production because they weren't all that great. Great. Uh, moving uh, a little bit in that direction, we got a number of questions about what the boundary is of your um, natural storage, um, so, well, actually natural and engineered. Uh, so I wonder uh, if you could talk just a little bit about um, soil-based uh, biomass storage, including biochar perhaps, and also ocean biofuel production, uh, just as, as things, are, are those, uh, lar do those give you um, uh, optimism about large numbers being possible, small numbers don't do it at any, under any yeah. conditions? I, I, um, I, I didn't talk for at all about, about oceans, obviously, and there has been lots of speculation about way that we might use biomass in the oceans to increase carbon storage. It's, um, it's important to recognize that on, on both the land and the ocean, there's a strong connection between biological fixation and biological release. And, and it takes very special circumstances for carbon to be stored for a long time, especially in the oceans where, where the um, typical delay between fixation in primary production by a phytoplankton and, and release in the uh, death of that organism or its consumption by another one is, is only a few days. So, so getting large amounts of storage is, is a much harder problem than just getting large amounts of photosynthesis. Uh, and there, there are ways to think about it, the sinking biomass that, that may turn out to be practical, although my guess is that they'll be quite limited. You know, we have lost a, a substantial amount of carbon from global soils. Rebuilding carbon stocks in soils is something that can be done with good stewardship, it can be done by increasing yields as well. And there are lots of win-wins in the biomass space, good stewardship of soils that can increase yields and increase carbon storage is, is one of the clearest win-wins. It's unlikely that the total amount of carbon stored is going to be a significant fraction of, for example, this uh, amount of negative emissions that are required in the rest of the century. Great. Uh, then we have, not surprisingly, given our audience some very good um, probing questions on uh, everything from 
the role of the private sector in promoting uh, negative net emissions, including natural and uh, engineered uh, sinks. Uh, and that may be the uh, private sector has many uh, elements to it that uh, things like green, is it greenwashing? Is it business opportunity in your view, dominantly uh, greenwashing, uh, business opportunities, uh, investment opportunities and whatnot. And alongside that, uh, more generally, a lot of interest in, uh, in uh, equity uh, defined pretty broadly. We actually had a, uh, several questions by a student from Iowa who said, who, who observed that in Iowa, uh, there's a lot of biofuel production and nobody uses it, in Cal uh, but it, they're cheap. In California, uh, there's uh, a lot of biofuel use, but it's uh, very expensive and by and large, we don't produce any. So any anything in that space that you would like to address further, uh, particularly given how we can all work together in a, uh, kind of fair and just to future, which seems to be the ethos of the current administration? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I'm really glad that people asked it. The, um, the balance sheet of how much we can accomplish with biomass energy and, and natural climate solutions, could um, it could be a large number or a small number with lots of private sector participation uh, with lots of commitment to uh, emphasis on equity and uh, empowerment of poor people or, or not uh, there they could evolve independently i would, i think uh, let's first look at the opportunities for the private sector and it, we have relatively immature markets for natural climate solutions, especially, and many of the arguments in favor of, of natural climate solutions are that they uh, provide um, compelling life opportunities for indigenous communities and for, um, for developing economies, and, and they certainly do, but at this point, the incentives are far from in place in order to bring those to maturity. Um, there's also the risk, especially if you think more in terms of uh, commercial biomass production, that some of the areas most important for indigenous communities might be converted to large scale plantations, which can generate large amounts of carbon, but are really hard to manage in, in, a, in an equity fulfilling mode. Um, there, there has been in the natural climate solutions community, especially a, a, an, an appropriate and important focus on advancing equity agenda in parallel with a, with a natural climate solutions agenda. And <clears throat> that will require a lot of work. In, um, in the biomass energy space, um, you know, I think we're likely to see the same kinds of trends that we've seen in other manufacturing and services and unless there's a real commitment to making sure that equity considerations are paramount yeah i know i know for example you're uh supporting some work on uh, market design in a way that's designed uh, maybe you need ngo uh, an international community support for this to make these offset schemes a good deal for these smallholders, so-called in developing countries, and not allow them to be used for the benefit paid for, but also for, uh, for the benefit of people outside, sometimes to the detriment of the uh, so-called smallholders. Uh, uh, do you think we need more uh, research in that area and more thought about how to organize that? and? create the proper incentives for both sides of the equation? Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, offset schemes where, uh, where an emitter can purchase offsets in order to continuing emitting but still meet um, a, a decreasing cap have been uh, in incredibly unpopular in the environmental justice community. The, for people who live near emitting facilities, the idea that the that the facility can continue emitting by 
uh, protecting a forest thousands of miles away is is um, grotesquely unfair, and I, I totally agree with that. And um, so, one of the things that we need to do is distinguish um, offsets that are essentially weaseling out of responsibility from uh, developing new ways to remove carbon from the environment, from the atmosphere, or to decrease emissions. And and I think that the design won't come out in a way that that works for people and communities and economies unless that's a really intentional goal. And I would say that we are just beginning to have the kinds of conversations about how to make that a reality. Super. Uh, more generally, uh, closing question in your transition to the post, uh, post event uh, press conference with uh, selected students. What advice would you give to students who want to join this uh, quest uh, for decarbonization from your point of view, everything from how can they um, get a job in your lab uh, or get into your grad program to uh, have a career that lasts many years that will be impactful. Any, any tips on where you think the, uh, the most help is needed and uh, therefore that would be um, most fulfilling for the students in the audience? Well, um, I'm, I'm always eager to talk with people who want to do research in this area, so they should definitely contact me. But, but I am seeing a real explosion of interest in uh, private sector ventures in this space, either focusing on carbon quantification, uh, using especially satellites and advanced eddy flux and lots of technologies for having a better sense of, of how carbon stocks are changing over meaningful landscapes, whole countries in many cases. Um, there's lots of work in actually setting up the financial markets. And, and we're seeing lots and lots of work in the actual you know, production and processing of the, of especially biomass energy. So I, I think that the stage we're at in general is that um, e even though a few aspects of, of this space are technologically mature, it's really only beginning to spin up as a, it's a core part of a broader climate solutions agenda. And my expectation is that it's gonna be a, um, you know, a, a, a big employer in coming decades in the finance space, in the technology space, in the environmental monitoring space, and hopefully in the environmental justice space as well. Great, uh, thank you so much, Chris. Uh, before I give you final thanks, I'd like to um, alert the normal, um, attendees of this seminar that there's no seminar next week in uh, uh, respect for the national holiday. I think it's President's Day next Monday, so no seminar next week. With that, I'd like to thank Chris one last time for a very engaging, thoughtful, and important uh, seminar on a subject of great importance. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, for all you do and for this great talk today. And now uh, you can transition to the student uh, portion of the talk for those lucky students. I think I, I'm unable to bid my way into the uh, post uh, seminar seminar. So thanks once again uh, for a great talk and uh, we'll look uh, forward to seeing more from you uh, every day uh, in the next uh, four years and hopefully more. Thanks. <laughs> thank, thank you, John. Great. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much.